Hello everybody, I'm Chris Provost, and today in Pearl's Park Pass, I'm gonna be doing kind of a business analyst video of what happened on Disney's shareholder meeting yesterday. I'm gonna be breaking it down, talking about it. I would love to hear your opinions, and this is what I asked from you guys. After you're done watching this video, I want me to I want you to tell me what you think. I don't want you just to say, Chris, I think you're absolutely right. I want you to critically think like, I, I think you're right here, I don't think you're right here. I want your guys' this critical thinking skills to kind of sharpen up here. Let's dissect what happened yesterday in the shareholders meeting. Now, before we even get to it, we got to talk about what is going on in the shareholders meeting. Why is it so important? For those of you who might not be familiar with a publicly owned company, when a company is publicly traded on the stock market, they have to have quarterly uh, shareholder meetings. That's where uh, anybody, and I mean anybody, who you have one share or millions of shares, they can get in, they can find out what's going on at the company, they ask the CEO questions about the company. That way they can kind of put their thumb on the pulse of how they feel the company's doing, and they can determine do they want to invest more money in the company, do they not want to, do they believe in the future of the company or not. And it's required for them to have these shareholder meetings to disclose what's going on within the company. Now, this is a monumental one for Disney because at this time, there was a proxy battle. There were uh, two other entities that were trying to get seats on the on the board of Disney. One was Nelson Peltz and the other was the Vanguard Company. Vanguard Company, I'm not going to really talk about because I think that was just more of like trying to dilute votes and shares, whatever. We can do that later if we ever wanted to. But Nelson Peltz was the big one. For even people who weren't familiar with what's going on in the stock market, they heard about this Disney proxy. My mom was like, hey, isn't this some guy like a train guy? His, his company's called Tryan, but he's like, he's trying to take over Disney. What's going on? She would ask the questions. So Nelson Peltz, he wanted to have two seats put on the Disney board. He wanted himself and another gentleman to be put on the board because he felt that Disney is not going the right direction. He's kind of lost faith within Disney. And then if you owned a share of Disney stock, you could either vote for uh, Disney, Vanguard, or Nelson Peltz. And the results were going to be announced during the stock, the, uh, the shareholder meeting. So a lot of investment was going on. A lot of interest was going on. Now, there was some weird things that happened, though. I have to be kind of honest with you. So Disney uh, had been running some ads on how to vote for the white card, which is a Disney card on YouTube was going around. So a lot of people were like, was Disney kind of worried about that? And then also in the last week, Disney had some endorsements from celebrities. George Lucas saying, oh, we trust we trust Bob Iger. Uh, vote, vote for that. And so Disney was doing a lot of this information. Then also what happened was there were three leaks. Now, it's okay if I was to vote, let's say if I had, if I owned shares and I voted for Nelson Peltz, I could say, hey, I voted for Nelson Peltz. And that's okay. I, I could, I could disclose that if, if I wanted to do that. What you can't do is if you are the Disney board, you can't disclose who people have voted for, or how the votes are stacking up until they announce the winner. But there was a leak. That's right. There was a leak three times where these like CNBC, large media organizations, they received information and says that they had enough votes that uh, Bob Iger was not, his board was going to be remain intact. And somehow they got that information that that information was leaked to them. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably leaked by somebody within the Disney organization. Why would Disney leak that information? One, that's kind of almost illegal. Um, you can't do that until after the, after the results to, to say that. But I think Disney was trying to flex, say, hey, nothing to worry about. They're trying to quell fears. I think they thought it might help punch up their stock. And I think that they were just trying to say, hey, we, we got this in the bag. So here's what happened. <clears throat> the meeting started and the meeting lasted about an hour. At the very beginning of the meeting, what they did is they, they said that they did have enough votes. Nelson Pelt did not get his two seats on the board, did not get his two seats on the board. Now, what we need to talk about here is we need to talk about the stock market. And I, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, or maybe you are, I'm going to break it down in a very simplified manner, okay? So you've got what's called the S&P 500. That's the standard of Poor's 500. These are kind of like the 500 largest companies on the stock market. And what they do, if these 500 companies, if all of their stocks are going up on a particular day, that tends to mean that the Wall Street is going up. They call that going up. And if these, if all, if the majority of these companies, if their stock is going down, then Wall Street typically goes down. It's kind of a good way. If you follow these S&P 500, it's a good way to tell how the stock market is doing, okay? Yesterday, the S&P was going up, okay? Wall Street was going up. That's important. Remember that. Now, Disney, when Disney made their announcement, their stock was about $122. The exact moment that they announced that Nelson Peltz did not win the, the, the proxy battle, guess what happened to Disney stock? Their stock went down. You see that? Disney stock went down. Now, why is this important? Wall Street's going up. Disney's going down. This is a rarity. So, Disney is part of this S&P, right? So, 
if, if the S&P, if the whole Wall Street is moving up, usually that those companies like their coattails or their writing coattails, momentum, the ebbs and flows, they, their stock would kind of mimic that. I think if Disney had made no announcement yesterday, Disney stock probably would have gone up like with the S&P. But what happened? The second they announced, announced the pelts didn't make it. Disney stock, stock dropped by about 3.5%. It went from $122, I think, down to about 118 at overnight trading. And that's called a negative beta. A negative beta is when the company is doing the exact opposite of the stock market. And that's kind of a rarity. It's not super rare, but it is kind of rare. Disney stock did a negative beta. S&P was going up. Disney stock is going down. What does that mean? Well, I think what that means is I think that a bunch of investors on Wall Street, they didn't like that. They wanted Nelson Peltz to, to, um, to maybe supercharge the company. And they were disappointed with the returns because their stock immediately dipped. Now, let's get into the shareholder meeting and what actually happened in the meeting. And I have a lot to cover with you guys. All right. <clears throat> so, after the announcement of Nelson Peltz, the stock went down. And uh, then, I think this is interesting, though. I think Disney now has no more room for excuses. Because prior to this, Bob Iger kind of played excuses on Bob Chapik. Bob Chapik was in office for 10 months and like two weeks, almost 11 months. Um, and now he can no longer use Bob Chapik as a scapegoat because he's been longer than uh, Bob Chapik was in office. And also, uh, uh, Bob Iger says that this Nelson Peltz proxy was a distraction, but now the distraction has gone, gone, they can go forward. So if the Disney stock or people aren't happy with the company in the next couple quarters, who's Disney to blame? Nobody but themselves. There's no there's no proxy going on. They can't blame it on Bob Chapik. So now it's really do or die time. The, the, the tires have hit the asphalt and they have to go. All right. So... Not a lot of announcements were made during the, stock, the shareholder meeting, but this isn't too surprising to me because I think Disney's probably trying to keep those announcements for D23, which happens in August. Um, they did show a small clip from Inside Out 2, and they also showed like a movie still from Moana 2, which it looks like to me that Moana is rowing away from maybe like a large clam or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. Now, here's what happened. This what I thought was very interesting. We get to the Q&A portion of the shareholder meeting. Now, it doesn't matter. Anybody who owns a share has the right to be able to ask questions to the CEO about the health of the company or what that's going to be going on in the future of the company. They have the right to know that. It doesn't matter if you have one share or a million shares, you can ask a question. This is what happened. And this was very odd to me. And I want you guys, as we go through this, I want you to put on your critical thinking. My, my teachers used to say, put on your thinking cap. I want you to think critically of what is happening here with these questions, okay? They said, okay, we're now we're to the Q&A portion. It used to be that Bob Iger had all the confidence in the world and all the swagger, and they had a big town hall, and people would be lining up at microphones. He's like, yes, he'd be like, point, with next question, next question. And people would ask their questions, like, my name's Jimmy, and my question is, and they'd ask their question. And Bob Iger's like, that's a great question, and he would answer the questions, right? That's not what happened in this meeting. What happened was they said the questions were pre-submitted, pre-submitted questions. And then they had an AI voice read the questions. And the questions that the AI voice read, they were a little bit odd, almost as if they were AI generated. I'm not saying that they were, but they were some odd questions. Now you have to keep in mind that there was probably thousands of questions that were submitted and Disney chose 10, 10 questions to answer. And then Bob Iger answered these 10 questions. Why do you think Disney chose these 10 questions? Now, of course, Disney can't just have 10 questions that are just awesome, amazing. They have to have some in there that are maybe like, uh, like has some concerns to make it feel more authentic. But why would Disney have these questions? And the other part that was really odd to me during this uh, shareholder meeting is Bob Iger was not on camera. For all we know, these questions, I'm sure that Bob Iger was given these questions in advance. I have no doubt about that. Uh, and his PR team helped him because craft all his answers. But he might have recorded these. And I mean, it, it might not have even been live. We don't know because Bob Iger wasn't even on camera. We would just hear an AI question. And then he would answer that question. Then we'd hear AI question, answer. And so that whole section might have been recorded, you know, a couple of days ago. And they just put it in. We don't know that. So it felt weird it didn't feel like it was a live meeting um but i want to read you these 10 questions that were asked and i want you to think critically why would disney choose these 10 questions to be asked and here we go and the first question was what is the long-term vision of the streaming assets which what challenges do you foresee in the execution so the first question is about you know disney streaming this and there's a big long answer but i'm going to highlight parts of the answer here okay here we go 
Ultimately, our goal is to achieve double digit operating margins. Okay, pause. Boom. This is really important because Nelson Peltz, who just didn't get who didn't get a seat on the board, that was one of the things he was running on and say, hey guys, Disney streaming is running at a loss. We need to get to double digit margins. And that was his marching. That was his theme that he's marching to. So the very first question that Disney gets is about streaming and what does Bob Iger say? We our ultimate goal is to get to double digit uh, margins, which is exactly what Nelson Peltz says. So I think that was literally, they were just trying to, to relay any fears that people might have, or, or maybe that was a dig. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so here we go. The, the streaming service is a testament to the exceptional content that we provide. Nothing more important than that. As I mentioned earlier, our extensive library of titles on Disney Plus just got a lot bigger with the official launch of Hulu on Disney Plus just last week. This marks the most significant technological, operational, and product events with the Disney Plus census launch and it reflects a wider tech transformation that has been underway in our in our streaming business for the last two years. ESPN will also factor into our overall streaming strategy. And you heard me talk about our plans for this new joint adventure, as well as our plans to create an incredibly interactive standalone streaming option for ESPN sometimes in sometime in 2025. Wow. Okay. So the first question, they tell us about your streaming your streaming stuff. And Bob Iger is like, oh, by the way, we're gonna go double digits. It sounds like to me, and then you talk about how just so, just so good as a coincidence that Disney and Hulu just merged and they're also going to be uh, uh, spinning off uh, ESPN. So this is like a perfect question to be asked to Bob Iger, the CEO of the company, because he was able to talk about all the accomplishments that just happened on the streaming platform. So I think that's probably why that question was chosen by Disney. All right, next question. All right, and keep in mind, is, are these real questions? What do you think? The parks are a special place and deserve to be maintained, restored, and treasured for the next generation and generations to come. How is Disney striving to restore the park service level and details that truly make Disney theme park experience special? That was the question. Like, you know, they need to be treasured for generations and generations to come. Okay, Bob Iger's answer. We've implemented more flexible park hopping options above Walt Disney World and Disneyland. We also recently sh shared a breakdown of how we plan to spend $60 billion in the next 10 years as part of our plans for turbocharging growth in our experienced businesses, while about 70% is focused on capacity expanding investments like bringing new lands, creating new attractions, adding new characters, and bringing shows to life. The remaining approximately 30% is focused on technology and the maintenance needed to do exactly what you're talking about in terms of maintaining the top quality of guest experiences. So this question was asked like, hey, what are you gonna do with parks? And Bob Iger's like, oh, by the way, remember we talked about the $60 billion investment? And then he went on to say that 70% of that 60 billion is gonna create new lands, we're gonna get new characters, new adventures, new rides. And the 30% of that 60 billion is gonna be maintaining parks and, and keeping creativity alive within the park. So that was the answer for that particular question. Again, remember, they're getting thousands of questions. Why did Disney choose that question? I think they wanted to talk about that $60 billion investment. All right. Now, this next question, I, I don't think that Disney can have every question be like rainbows and ponies and all that stuff and cupcakes. This question, I think, was uh, they Disney needed to address it. And keep in mind, these are pre-recorded questions. And I felt like Bob Iger kind of bungled the answer on this one. And I think the PR team didn't do a very good job. I'm going to read you the entire answer to this question. And you tell me what you think. How do you feel? Do you feel satisfied with this answer? <clears throat> question. With Epic Universe opening in Orlando in 2025, why hasn't Disney prepared anything or placed more than just a handful of attractions in the pipeline to be ready for this in 2025 at Walt Disney World? Okay. This is a two-part answer. Answer. Well, thank you very much for your question, but that couldn't be further from the truth. We've been aware of universal plans for a new park for more than a decade, and we have a sophisticated approach to analyzing the needs of our business and strategically deploying capital. But I just want to remind you of a few things at Walt Disney World during this same time. We opened Pandora, the world of Avatar in Animal Kingdom, Toy Story Land, Star Wars Galaxy Edge, and Minnie and Mickey's Runaway Railway in Hollywood Studios. We also completed a multi-year billion dollar transformation of Epcot, which included Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, Moana's Journey of Water, and the great attraction of Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. And we opened Tron Light Cycle Run in Magic Kingdom. Okay, now he's gonna have more answer coming here, but I think it's important to talk about this because he literally is like, hey, we have opened a ton of stuff in the pipeline and we did it strategically for you. 
Now, here's the rest of this answer. This is where I think it's a little weird. So, by staggering these launches, we've been able to commercially and operationally op optimize our new offerings over time rather than having it, it to do it all at once based on the guest experience that we heard from about from all of our of these items that I just mentioned. We know they are extremely popular and they're serving our guests extremely well. Um, and then he went on to talk about uh, this whole part. The rest of the answer is about like working with the Florida Tourism Board to have this new $60 billion expansion. That answer is interesting to me. 10 years ago, Disney, this is the shareholder meeting and clear getting questions about Universal Studios. 10 years ago, Disney never would have even mentioned or even acknowledged Universal Studios. And now all of a sudden during the Q&A portion, they have to acknowledge what's going on with Epic Universe. And Bob's Iger is like, hey, don't worry about it. We've been staggering all these things, opening a little bit at a time. And we, we have this way to determine that our guests are super happy with all of our offerings. And don't worry, we're going to be doing some $60 billion openings in the future. I think that was a, I don't know if I feel super comfortable with that answer. I want Disney to be stronger with it. Bob Iger used to be the guy that come out, guns blazing. He's like, this is what we're going to do. And you're going to love it. And we loved it. And now all of a sudden he's like, oh, don't worry about it. We've been doing things over the last 10 years and kind of, you know, it, it felt weird to me. All right. But I don't know. Maybe that was a good answer. What do you guys think? Next question. What is Disney doing considering, what is Disney doing or considering doing to broaden the reach of their films beyond younger people who may gravitate more towards animated uh, films, et cetera, et cetera, to reach more middle-aged and older people. So this question is, hey, you know, what films are you going to be doing so that it's just not for kids, right? And then uh, Bob Iger had this answer. Here we go. Um, Hitting theaters are our next installments of the 20th century's popular franchise, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes and Alien Romulus. Those will attract audience beyond just young people. Studios like Marvel will continue to broaden with offerings like Deadpool and Wolverine, which is the most anticipated film of 2024, according to Fandango, and is Marvel's first R-rated movie. We are also excited about animated titles like Inside Out 2 and Moana 2, which we have something, so we have something for everyone and remain focused on quality that we produce, which you'll see reflected in releases moving forward. All right, so the question was, hey, are you going to have any movies for adults? And all of a sudden, Disney's like, oh, by the way, yeah, we do. It's like almost like it's an advertising pitch, right? We've got Alien Romulus coming out, Wolverine, Dead, Deadpool and Wolverine, The Kingdom of Planet of Eggs. And don't worry, but we do have things for children, Inside Out 2 and Wanted 2. I mean, I guess, I, I mean, that's what Disney felt like they wanted to talk about. All right, next question. This is where I think Disney's trying to placate the audience without placating to the audience. Here we go. As societal values and norms change, how does the Walt Disney Company balance the task of evolving with the times to create timeless content that appeals to the current generations while still preserving its legacy of rich traditions of human connection and original storytelling? Okay, so the question is basically like how the, the, well, the times are evolving. How are you going to make everybody happy type of thing? Okay. After all these years, we're still guided by the same core ideals that respect, understanding, and compassion, and an unwavering sense of optimism. Back to our stories, uh, back to our stories, continue to celebrate heroes, emphasize the value of family and friendship, and it's still a steady phase. <coughs> excuse me, and still that steady phase of tomorrow that can always be a brighter uh, than today. Our visionary storytellers draw on their own lives and experiences to create a content for all audiences. That captures the beauty of the world around us. And we're a storytelling company first and foremost, and we will always be guided by desire to create exceptional stories and characters that audiences all over the world can connect with. Okay, so Disney's answer to that is, hey, we create stories that connect with everybody around the world and um, they're good storytelling and our storytellers draw upon their life experience to create compelling stories where the hero can make the world a better place tomorrow than it is better than today. And I think that Disney, why would Disney choose that question and why would they answer it that way? I think that what they're trying to do is they're trying to placate to everybody saying, hey, we have stories for everybody, no matter where, what, are, what your walks of life are, we have stories for everybody. All right, now this next question, I this is baffling to me, like baffling, like baffling that I, I'm baffled by this. I, I don't understand it. I don't pretend to understand it. And I would like your guys' input on it. Ready, here we go. 
In September of 2023, Mr. Iger and Mr. DeMauro announced a $60 billion investment in the Disney Experiences division. This led to much excitement and speculation among Disney fans about what would change or what additions might come to parks. So far, there's been no announcement of what the investments are. Um, all we have been given is a lot of blue sky ideas at D23 and other events. Will there be any announcements soon? Um, what will we see in these investments? Okay, so this is like the perfect question, right? To give everybody a hype for D23 is the perfect question, I think. This is like a softball, it's a t-ball question. You gotta hit this one out of the park. You have to hit this one in the park. This is like the question everybody's kind of curious about. They put the question out there and people are like excited. We wanna know what's gonna be happening. And here was the answer. It was the shortest answer that Bob Iger gave of the shareholder meeting. You know, we have a lot of projects in development. Development. Many of them are known to us, but we disclose these at a cadence when we really feel we are ready and we have something more tangible to show people. That's it. That's the answer. That's it. That's the answer. I don't know. That's it. That's so confusing to me. Um, I feel like the, I feel like this is a bit of time. Like he's like I feel like he could say you guys. We have so many cool things coming in the pipeline. Your little brain can't handle it. And you're going to see a lot of these announced at D23. You're going to, our, our, our Imagineers are working so hard. We have these great things. Instead of just saying, when we feel we're ready, we'll have something more tangible to show people. That scares me a little bit. That scares me a little bit. Do they not have any big plans yet coming out that they're going to be making at D23? I don't know. I'm just speculating. That was just such a weird answer to me to that question. And I don't get it. So, okay. Next question that was asked. Does the company provide any mentorship opportunities for high school students? Bob Iger went on to say this. I appreciate that question, but we actually don't have any formal high school mentoring programs. But we certainly believe strongly in the importance of creating opportunities for the next generation. And we're proud to participate in numerous other activities aimed at opening doors for young people. Um... We're proud, obviously, of our track record in, in terms of supporting communities like children's hospitals um, and programs that involve like Make-A-Wish, which is now decades old, a partnership with them. And something we're extremely, extremely happy about is our Heroes That Work Here program, which inspired thousands of veterans to come work for the company of Walt Disney. And also the Disney Inspired um, offers tuition support for eligible employees. I think that that question was put in there. because, like, hey, do you have any... Um, things for high schools no we don't but hey these are all the great things you do make a wish but we work with veterans we got tuition assistance i think it was disney's way of trying to show how much they give back we're working with hospitals how much they give back to the, the community next question is it possible for disney to stay out of political and social agendas and just provide entertainment Great question. People, I think a lot of people feel like Disney has gotten involved in politics or social agendas and they, agendas and they want to create this great uh, entertainment. This was the answer. First, our job is to entertain uh, first and foremost. And by telling great stories, we continue to have positive impact on the world, inspire future generations. Just as we've done for over 100 years the, uh, here, here at Disney. Disney has always been and will always continue to be a source of hope and joy and optimism for people of all ages. We're committed to telling stories that reflect the world around us, using these stories to entertain people from all walks of life. I've always believed that we have a responsibility to do good in the world, but we know our job is not to advance any kind of agenda. So as long as I'm in this job, I'm going to continue to be guided by a sense of decency, respect, and will always trust um, my feelings, our feelings. Okay. I think that question was literally put there so that Disney can say, "Hey, we're a good company. We we try to we try to we're trying to bring good to the world." And was trying. I think they're trying to tell you guys as shareholders, don't forget that. All right, uh, here we go. Two more questions, and this is where this next question here is where I just really it just really hit me home. I don't think these questions were randomly selected. I don't think Bob Iger was sitting in front of a button like a board and they hit a button and the fifty thousand questions like this would pop up and he answered it because this was too spot on of an answer. Next question. How do you, th what do you think about women's sports within the ESPN portfolio? That's the whole question. 
And then he went on to say, I think it's quite uh, evident that its popularity has grown tremendously just by the results of uh, this week of the women's college basketball postseason game where the between Iowa and LSU attracted over 12 million, 12 million viewers. And then he went on to say, and just to put that number into context, it ranks above all but one of the men's NCAA tournament games, all but one NBA finals game and every World, season, World Series game in the most recent postseason. So they're... So that's just a tremendous, tremendous. I think it's an affirmation that not only is women's sports, um, let me see, I think it's a tremendous affirmation that only was uh, whether they're potentially, I'm not sure, I don't understand what this is saying, whether their potential is so tremendous and that ESPN is pleased to be part of that and expects to be part of that growth of women's sports for years to come. Okay, 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 okay. I get what he's trying to do. So the question was like, how do you feel about uh, women's sports in the ESPN portfolio? And he went on and he had all these statistics. Like, hey, this one, this one college basketball game drew more viewership than uh, the World Series, drew more uh, men's basketball. And by the way, uh, uh, guess what? Uh, we, we have ESPN and we're going to be doing a lot of women's uh, sports programming. So I think that was just a plug for themselves. This last one is also a little bit of a head scratcher for me. I think I know what Disney's trying to do here, but I don't know. I mean, who knows? Last question they took. Will other Taylor Swift concerts be added to Disney Plus like the Reputation Stadium Tour? That's the question. The answer. Well, we're actually thrilled. Uh, well, we're actually thrilled that we're able to reach an agreement with Taylor and team to put her film her most recent concert tour on the Disney Plus, which has done extremely well. We have high, high regard for her and through her millions and millions of fans around the world. We'd like nothing more to continue a great continue her our great relationship with her. That's the answer. Why would they do that one? I, are they are they pandering to Taylor Swift saying, hey, we want more of your concerts. Taylor, we love you. Let us have more concerts for more content on Disney Plus. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I want you to critically think of those 10 questions, why did Disney choose those 10 questions? These are pre-recorded questions. I don't think they're just randomly, they're just popping up and Bob Iger's just randomly looking at them. He had those answers there. And I, I want to know, how do you feel about this? Do you feel good about this? What is going on? I think there is a, a massive, the expectations, I think, because of this shareholder meeting for D23 coming in August are incredibly high. I hope Disney can meet those expectations. I hope they meet those expectations. But I think people want some more concrete, solid answers. Put it down in the comments down below. How do you feel about the shareholders meeting? Were you disappointed by uh, the, the what was announced? Are you, are you happy with what's going on? I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on it. I ask that you, I want your critical thoughts though. I don't want you to just, just regurgitate back what I said. I want to what, know what you think. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you disagree. That's perfectly fine. We can have a discussion. We can also disagree, but we can still be friends. Uh, hit the like and subscribe button and I'll see you guys later. I have a bunch of Disney content coming out here. It is awesome. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.